and here's the thing. I really, want, really, to, I really want to do this a moving one. Yeah, you go right ahead. So, um, and I'll be off camera if I do this. So let's back it up here. This gives me some leeway. I need to be a little closer. So just pretend this is uh, your top producer uh, associate at your office. Because I'm going to address the other person. Are you recording? We're recording. Oh, we're recording. Yes. Hello. Welcome to KR Success Coaching. We have the pleasure and honor and privilege of being here at Century 21 Showcase. We've got Dave Patty. We've got Jeff Stoffel. And we have the amazing Century 21 Showcase team. And we're excited. Today, we're going to be covering language. Yes? Yes. How many of us would like to learn how to master our language? How many of us would like to learn how to find out what's behind what people are saying? Like kind of going underneath. How many of us have people saying things to us and we're like, uh, what does he mean by that? What's really, what's going on behind that? Yes? How many of us are, uh, you're working with clients and you like to find out what's behind what your clients are saying? How many of us are in a position of management and you like to find out what's behind what your employees are saying? Yes? How many of us have kids and you like to find out what's behind what your kids are saying? We've all got things that we want to learn specifically behind what people are saying. So we're going to be learning language today and we're going to be learning how to become an influential listener. By the way, if I were to say to you, I'm thirsty, I'd like to have some water. Like a British, British person would say, I'd like to have some water. How many of us would say, hmm, that's interesting. He's thirsty. I think maybe you should get a glass of water. <laughs> no, right. How many of us would feel compelled to stand up, go across the room, go get a glass of water and give me a glass of water? What if I went, <coughs> <coughs> need a glass of water? <coughs> How many of us would feel compelled to get a glass of water? So we're learning exactly just like I'm not no matter what. So we have a room full of real estate, realtor, agents, people I'm sure that are in mortgage or in some way associated to it, leaders, entrepreneurs, salespeople. So today we're going to learn about language and we're going to learn all those benefits that I just covered. So let's first talk about uh, an overview of everything that we will do in language. We're not going to necessarily get into all of it today but just an overview of some things for us to talk about. And then we're going to go in specifically into presuppositions, which is basically learning what's presupposed in what someone says to us, learning what's behind, what's the meaning behind what they're saying, and learning how to make our, our ears so in tune to what people are saying so we know exactly what's going on. Yes? How many of us would also like to know what... How many of us have ever heard the term map of the world? Model of the world. <clears throat> NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, we believe everybody has a model of the world, a certain way they see the world, perceive the world, the way they perceive themselves and the world. Make sense? We're going to learn by presuppositions how to find out what their model of the world is, how to find out what their beliefs are what their values are, what their principles are, without even asking them what it is, but just listening to how they talk. How many of us would also like to find out what a person's model of the world is, what their beliefs are, without even having to ask that awesome, awkward, awkward question? Why? Because we're going to let you know today that a lot of their belief systems, a lot of their ways of thinking is presupposed in the language they use, right? So. You think of Superman and he has this laser vision, right? What would that be like if you were Superman or Superwoman and you had laser hearing? Yes, would that be powerful? That's what today's about. Okay, so let's go over the conscious, conscious use of language. We're going to be learning about using specificity or ambiguity in language. Now, a lot of us, we want specificity because we want to get the details, correct? And we're also going to learn ambiguity. We just had an election. And a certain person won the election. 
And I, I know that we all agree with this statement that no matter what, on all sides of politics, politicians are very good at staying a little bit ambiguous. They're very good at, you know, throwing out these big words that have, you know, sound great, but they're not necessarily spending as much time going into the minutiae and the details of what they plan to do, maybe because they don't have a plan yet. <laughs> because they're gonna figure out what they're gonna do when they get the job. So learning ambiguity is a way to, and we'll learn a little bit later, is a way to have everybody agree with what you're saying and not able to argue on any specific points. So this is about building agreement. Who here would like to learn how to build agreement with anybody, anywhere, anytime? Who here would like to learn how to not have anybody disagree with anything you have to say? Absolutely. Hypnotic language patterns how to utilize them, how to use unspecified language. So when we leave out certain details and we allow something to be a little bit more ambiguous, we build more agreement. Make sense? We're gonna learn about that. The agreement frame. What are things that you might say when you agree with someone that builds rapport, that builds connection? You might say, I appreciate that. You might say, I respect that. You might say, I agree. I agree with you on that. By the way, how many of us like people agreeing with us? We all like agreeing with yes? How many of us like people uh, disagreeing with us? No hands go up, of course. You might also want to avoid using the word but. So circle the word but. How many of us use the word but sometimes? Uh, can you check and make sure it's still recording? Because I don't see me, even though. Yeah, we're still live. Look at that. We're still live. So I know that when I see me and I see you, I see everybody. And I know that whenever there's any, any obstacle to me seeing me or me seeing you, I know you're still there and you're still listening. Awesome. Give yourselves a round of applause for being here today, you guys. So the word but negates everything that comes after it. I mean before, right? So I love you, but, you know, uh, uh, what do you feel when someone says that, right? Like, oh my gosh, you don't love me. Somehow you love me, but you just took it away <laughs> in the same sentence. Well, I understand. So a lot of people, we can argue a little bit back and forth on this. A lot of people think understand is a good word to use. That's what most people think. I understand how you feel. I mean, maybe if the right tonality, you could sell it into being a good word. But what we're, what we're saying is, Oh, I understand. You know, it can sometimes be, uh, the person can almost sometimes feel like you are condescending. Oh, I understand, you know, that's difficult for you. No. So we want to use more clear-cut rapport words like I appreciate, I respect, I agree, and we want to avoid using but or understand. All right, is this useful so far? Absolutely. Number four, the purpose frame. For what purpose? So what we're going to be essentially learning is how to get people to their highest intention. When we ask for what purpose, for what purpose do you want to be a top producer in this business? I can come into the office every day and say, I'm going to make money. I'm going to close more transactions. But for what purpose? So who would like to quickly volunteer? If I asked you for what purpose, what would you say? Why, 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 why be a top producer? Why come in here and even be, you know, close two, three, four, five transactions a month? I heard Dave just close five, so five houses in one day. Let's give Dave a round of applause. So for what purpose? Yes. What's the kind of lifestyle I'd like to have? To have the kind of lifestyle I'd like to have. Awesome. For what purpose? Exactly. She's hesitating, and that's not a bad thing. She's now connecting, my gosh, lifestyle for what purpose? She's connecting to a higher purpose, something that maybe she doesn't think about on a daily basis, to have an even better lifestyle for what purpose? So I can um, have 
uh, better things for my family, a better car, a better home. So I can have better things for my family. What would that give you? What would that do for you? It would make me feel good. Make me feel good. So we're getting to what the higher purpose is. Now, if you notice the energy, maybe you're watching it, you noticed, but maybe if you're in the room, you notice the energy of the room shifted a little bit when I asked that question. The conversation got very real. It wasn't superficial. It wasn't the materialism on this level, but it became more about family. It became more about something more important. And what we're doing is we're connecting people to that thing that for them is more what? Important. Okay. Number five, the way frame. What would happen if, let's say you have a client that uh, doesn't feel comfortable, doesn't feel confident in you or the process or whatever, doesn't know, doesn't feel sure their house will sell or that you'll find the right house. You could ask them the what if frame. What would happen if we closed not only on time, but we closed early? What would happen if, I, if, if we got your asking price in the next 20 to 30 days? How would you feel? Right? So what you're doing with the what if frame is you're putting them in the frame of what if you got your successful conclusion. Make sense? Uh, what would be another example of something where some client of yours or person of yours doesn't have certainty, maybe has doubt? Can anybody think of an example where your client has doubt? During the listing presentation, sometimes the client goes, well, you know, you're new, I don't, haven't seen you in the area, and have this brochure from the stock producer that's well known. That would be kind of the scenario, so. So I'm new, so Veronica just shared an example where I'm new, I'm an agent that's new. The client feels that I'm new in the area, but yet they probably should work with someone else that they know that's not new from the area, that has this experience, and ha that has a reputation. What would happen if you knew by working with me right now that you would actually sell your house quicker, or you would get the house that you want quicker because I have a whole team that works with me, right? I have a wealth of experience in the city, and I'm bringing that here, and I'm going to take on your goals as if they're my own. That agent may be working with many, many buyers, many, many sellers. They may be, you know, putting, dividing their attention among many people. How would you like to know the fact that I, when I work with you, I'm going to take on your goals personally, and I'm going to make sure I serve you without making you happy? You see the headline. <coughs> what would happen if? So what I'm doing is I'm putting the client in the position of what would happen if they got their result. So I'm going to give you a few seconds, and I want you to think of an objection that you get from a client, any objection, where they have some doubt or some uncertainty regarding anything. Selling a home, buying a home, you, you know, your, the quality of your service, maybe they're meeting you for the first time, maybe they think, you know, sales reps are, you know, agents are all the same, whatever, whatever their perceptions are, they have some doubt or some uncertainty. Can you think of something? Yeah, and then start to think of what would happen if, if you were speaking to them and you said, what would happen if we got this done in record time? How would you feel? What I'm doing is I'm taking them out of this place of I'm not sure to what would happen if I'm absolutely sure. Make sense? So you can apply that. Number six, using words that create positive IRs. Say it the way you want it. How many of us would like to learn how to create positive pictures in our client's heads? Positive dialogue in our client's heads. So you're gonna learn through this process of mastering NLP language, you're gonna learn how to direct the pictures and the voice in your client's head. Who here would like to learn how to direct, be the director of the pictures and the, the dialogue and the feelings in your client's head? You're going to do that by suggesting positive IRs. A lot of us work in an industry, correct, where people have doubt and have uncertainty. They have pictures of, you know, I'm not getting what I want. You're going to build pictures in their head, internal dialogue, voices in their head, essentially, focused on the outcome and successful conclusion of the transaction, and only that. You're going to learn that by directing it with language. So this is very powerful. Who knew that just by your language alone, you could actually create worlds with your clients? 
Who knew that just by your language alone, you could actually create anything with your clients? You could take a negative client mindset and turn it into a positive mindset. You could take a client that has fear, that has concerns, and create absolute congruency, certainty in your client. How powerful would that be? All by the language you use. You could even run for US president and win the election, I'm just telling you. Absolutely. Number seven, conditional quotes. So if we did this, would you do this? How many of us have ever bought a car and you recall the salesperson using a conditional close with you? Like if we were to knock your payment down by 50 bucks or 100 bucks or whatever, would you take action today? Notice this. Would you, you know, I'm going to go see my manager. I mean, I don't have the authority to, to give you this price, this, this payment, but I'm going to see my finance manager. And you know, before I go to my finance manager, if we did agree to this, this number that you're telling me we want to get to, would you, would you buy the car today? What is that? That's a conditional close. So how many of us are using the conditional close in your business already? If I do this, would you do that? Because if I don't use a conditional close, what am I essentially doing? I'm saying, let me go do this work. I'm going to get you what you want. And you still don't have to take action. There's no commitment to me. I'm committed to you, but you're not committed to me. Whereas when I use the conditional close, if I do this, if I commit to this, will you commit to that? So we're meeting each other halfway, yes? Give someone a high five and say, I'm meeting you halfway. I'm meeting you halfway. <laughs> All right, number eight, tag questions. This is something you're interested in, isn't it? You know you want this house, don't you? You know you've made this decision to, to buy this house, haven't you? You know that all that fear, that concern about this is not the right time to sell your house, you know that's gone, isn't it? <laughs> Do you notice all the little endings to those sentences? Don't you, won't you, haven't you, isn't it? All of those are tag questions. So what we find when you use tag questions is it displaces the resistance of your clients. How many of us would like to take this resistance that our clients have and to remove it. So it's the tag question really does that. So let's take a moment and think of something that you want to say to your client and you might use the word isn't it, won't you? You'll, you'll, you'll make the decision today. Let's say you've got, I'll give you an example. Let's say you've got a client who's procrastinating. They want to sell their house, they want to, they want to decide to sell, they're on the fence, they want to buy, or whatever, whatever your scenario is and they're procrastinating, what might you say? You know that you've already really made the decision to take action now, haven't you? You know that you really want this house. You know that if we don't take action on this house, someone else probably will buy it, don't you? <laughs> right, by getting into this house, by or selling your house right now, is the perfect time to do it right now, isn't it? So you're saying a statement, and then the top question at the end displaces their resistance and sort of ties them down to taking action. So I'm going to give you a few seconds, and I want you to think of something that you might say to your client. Think of a client scenario where you want to displace their resistance, and what's a sentence you would say with a top question? And if you think of one, just let me know. You know it makes sense too? Yeah, you know this absolutely, this totally makes sense to do this right now, isn't it? Right? Or doesn't it? Don't you? You know this makes sense, don't you? This is the perfect house for you, isn't it? This is the perfect house for you, isn't it? Yeah. Getting that 3% interest rate or 3.5% interest rate is, is better, don't you agree? Don't you agree? Well, isn't it? Isn't it? Absolutely. Awesome. Over here? You know this is the right house for you, don't you? You know this is the house, right? The, the right house for you, don't you? See, I can even put a little tonality in it. Let me do that twice. You know this is the right house for you, don't you? Don't you? Upswing, don't you? You know this is the right house for you, don't you? Don't you? <laughs> right? So the tonality is it's going down 
it almost becomes an embedded command. Write the word down, embedded command. It's not an embedded command, but it is, in a way, uh, sounds like one because it's, the tonality is deeper, lower, and it's a little bit, got a little bit more force to it. You know this is the right time, don't you? You know you've got to take action on this house right now, don't you? Because if you don't take action on this house right now, you know what will happen, don't you? <laughs> Someone else will, right? So they, they say the early bird catches the worm. I don't know if that's true, but you know, maybe it's true. Okay, so that's type questions. Now let's turn to, so that was page 35. Let's turn to page 36. So remember we talked about presuppositions, yes? Learning what's behind the meaning of the people, your clients. Who here wants to learn what's behind the meaning of what your clients say? Who here wants to learn what's the behind the meaning of what your employees say, or your business partners say, or your kids say, correct? Okay, perfect. So presuppositions are the equi equivalent of linguistic assumptions. So do you know what the word assumption means? Yes. What's assumed, right? So presuppositions only means assumptions that are linguistic. Language assumptions, make sense? Pretty simple. So you're, what you're doing is you're finding out what's assumed by what your client says. And you're gonna learn this is a little bit tricky, but very easy to do. But what I mean by tricky is a lot of people don't pick up the subtle nuances of what a person says. You're gonna learn how to do that like a pro. Who here wants to learn it like a pro? Absolutely. Okay. All right, so there's some categories. There's nine categories. Definition, definition presuppositions are linguistic assumptions and are useful for recognizing what is assumed by the client's speech and assisting them. If you were to know what's assumed by client, your client's speech, would that give you a lot more power? It would, right? And then also creating new pictures in their mind that serve them taking action, new internal dialogue. How many of us realize we all have voices in our head that talk to us all day long? Some people, the voice is a positive voice, like an angel. Other of us, that voice is like a grandma. You know, now you won't do that. That won't happen like the negative voice. What, we, what we're going to learn is how to get rid of their negative chatter and direct their language in their head to taking action with you. Now, the question is, how much more successful would you be in your business if you mastered this? How much more money would you make? How much more money would you take home to your, your family? What would your lifestyle be like? Yes. Okay, number one, existence. So, tip-offs for existence is nouns. Let's say if I said to you, book, I, I see a book. What does that presuppose? I know it's very basic, it's pretty obvious. What does that presuppose is in the room? A book. A book. That's pretty simple, right? The, the presupposition of existence is not terribly, and it's very simple, it's very easy, it's not something that's uh, uh, hard to pick up. When someone says, you know, I went horse riding today, what does that presuppose? There was what there? A horse. A horse. So it's pretty simple. Okay, so that's the most basic one. And it's the most prevalent. People are using the presupposition of existence all the time. Number two, the presupposition of possibility and necessity is a very, very, very valuable. And you want to really pay close attention to that. The presupposition of possibility and necessity is tipped off by the modal operator. Now, Please write these down. What are examples of modal operators? Should, shouldn't, must, mustn't, <laughs> can't, can, ought to, have to, need to. These are all examples of modal operators of possibility or necessity. Now, I was working with a client and she came to me because she had issues with alcohol. And uh, I said, how much do you drink? And she said, well, never less than two bottles of wine. I'm like, 
two bottles of wine by yourself? She says, well, not, not quite. My husband's there. And I'm like, well, how much does your husband drink? She goes, no, never more than a glass. So he drinks not more than a glass, but somehow two bottles of wine are gone. So does he notice you drunk two balls? Does he notice you falling flat on your face, completely drunk? She says, no, but he should. Interesting word, the word should. Because, uh, you know, it's either, I asked her, either he notices you're drunk and you're falling flat on your face, or he doesn't. It's either a yes or no question, correct? But her response was, he should. Don't you find that uh, interesting? Just by that one word, should, what can we presuppose? What can we presuppose by that one word, should? She feels neglected. He's clear, she's clearly after his attention, yes? What else can we uh, presuppose by that one word, should? She could be angry. Maybe she's not angry. Maybe she's just desperate. Maybe she's something else. We don't necessarily know what emotion, but there's probably emotion there. It's also clear that she's after his attention, yes? So she's not getting his attention because he should, he doesn't notice. And the word should presupposes that she's clearly after his attention. So then I got a call a few days after she had come out. Uh, uh, this is prior to me working with her. I learned that she went into an uh, uh, alcoholic coma where one day she got so drunk, she veered off out of the house, went to a local park, passed out, and then forgot who she was and was walking around. Some people just thought she was homeless. No one bothered for a few days. And the next thing she was picked up by the police, taken to emergency room for alcohol poisoning. And she was in the emergency room for about a week. And when I asked her about that, I'm like, okay, this is another prior event that happened early days, right? Before, you know, I'm working with you now. I asked her, I said, well, did your husband notice that you were gone? for three days in the emergency room, <laughs> another, uh, you know, you know, three days at the, at, the, at the park and what a number of days at the emergency room. She used an interesting uh, word. She said, well, he, he should. Isn't that interesting? Who here has a significant other? You're married, got a boyfriend, a girlfriend. How long will it take for you to notice your partner's gone. <laughs> Dave just recently told me he'd be back by 10 seconds <laughs> before his uh, soon-to-be new wife would notice that he's gone or that he might notice she's gone. <laughs> so there's something interesting going on with that, yes? Doesn't that one word, he should, tell us a little bit about that whole relationship? And is it interesting that we learned all of that, whatever your Figuring about that relationship, we learn just by the word what? Should. So we ought to really listen, yes? Okay, next one. Cause and effect. When you hear the sentences like to make, so write these down. To make. Like he makes me sad. Has anybody ever said that to you? He makes me sad. He makes me happy. That's a tip off of a cause and effect statement. Now there are some cause and effect statements that are legitimate. Example, if you work out every day, that will make you stronger. Is that legitimate? Especially if you're not working out on the same muscle again and again every single day. That might kind of defeat the purpose, right? So the word to make tells us that there's a cause and effect. Now, what are we doing here? We're looking at the language of what they use, and we're looking at the connection between the things that they're saying, and we're starting to see that there's a cause and effect structure in what, we're, in what they're saying. All of this is gonna make more sense as we continue to go. We're just getting the concepts down, but you'll start to apply this to the language you hear from your clients. So cause and effect, number one is makes, to make. The second one is if-then. If-then. 
If this, then that. That also is a tip off for what? Cause and effect. Make sense? The word because, also the word because, is obviously because. Right? I could say to you, don't sit in this chair. By the way, we have a change chair at all of our seminars. So I want you to imagine there's the change chair here. I could say, don't sit in this chair because that's the change chair. No one has ever sat in this chair and not changed. So how many feel like when you sit in this chair that you'll change? Right? Because this is the what? Change. The change chair. So how powerful would it be if you started to learn how to use cause and effect in your language with your clients? You know, meeting with me today because I'm going to get your house sold. Work with me today because I'm going to get you exactly what you want. Because I'm going to take on your goals as if they're my own goals. I, I have a very personable relationship with my clients. And that's the reason why I'm going to serve you and get your deal done quickly, effectively, and to your, to your great level of satisfaction. So what you're doing is you're putting the word because and you're linking this to this. Make sense? Next one. Um, by the way, if we were doing hypnotherapy, I would say, don't go into trance yet. Trance is a, a relaxed state of mind. Just a relaxed state of mind. I would say, don't go into trance yet because I need to ask you some questions while you're not in trance. What's presupposed in that? That once I finish asking the questions, they're going to be in a trance. We came up with a real estate one uh, yesterday, two days ago. Don't sign this listing agreement yet until I've gone through three things with you first. Don't sign this listing agreement yet because I'm going to go through these three things first with you. What's going to happen when you've gone through those three things? They're going to sign a listing agreement, right? So don't sign the listing agreement just yet because when I'm done going through these things, three, these three things with you, then you'll know it's the right time, won't you? Tag question, right? Displacing resistance. So what's presupposed in that? As soon as I've gone through the three things, they're going to sign. Okay, so many times people use cause and effect inappropriately. Who has ever heard someone say, right, the verb to be, right? One of the cause and effects is to make. He makes me sad. He makes me frustrated. She makes me, she hurts me. That's a cause and effect. This person does something to us, right? Would you agree we hear that all the time? You made me get angry. You made me scream. I wasn't screaming. You walked in the door. You did this. And now it's all your fault. Look. Do we hear that? What Milton Erickson would say, he's one of the most famous hypnotherapists of all time and a master of language, he would say, you choose the experience of the experience. No one makes you anything. So there's an experience, and you choose what state you're going to be in from that experience. No one makes you anything. In fact, there's a quote. Please write it down. You've heard this before. And the quote is, if anybody can make you happy, angry, or sad, it's you. You've been happy. You've given your power away. No one makes you anything. Only you make yourself anything. Right now, someone could say, you know what, Kamaya? Someone stopped me in the face. I could thank you so much. I feel awake. I feel awake like I'm getting and I'm ready to get into a football game. And, you know, they, they beat each other's chest together. They pump each other up. I could use that as inspiration. Someone could push me and shove me, and I could get really upset about it. So I'm choosing what I'm going to use that outward stimulus for, Correct. So why am I mentioning this? Because with cause and effect, we find a lot of times people are using cause and effect to somehow portray themselves as a victim in a situation. Instead of using it by volition to create 
successful results with people. Okay, what's next? Complex equivalence. I love this one. The tip-off, that's number four, for complex equivalence is, is the verb is, or the verb to be, or the verb to mean. So I'll throw something out there to you, and you let me know what you think. She looked at me funny when she walked in the door, and that means she doesn't like me. The broker came in, and he said hi to those four agents, but he didn't say hi to me. That means he prefers them. He doesn't like me. There's something about me he doesn't like. How much have ever heard some people say that? You know, the person walked in and gave me a funny look. That means they don't like me. We hear this all the time, yes? Well, it doesn't actually mean that. What the person is doing is they're linking two things with a verb to be or mean that are not necessarily linked together. She walked in, she looked at me funny. Means that she doesn't like me. It actually doesn't. She just walked in. She gave me a funny look. A person liking me or not liking me is, has absolutely nothing to do with this other statement. So when we say she walked in the room, means that she doesn't like me, what that essentially is doing is linking two things together that are not linked. That's called complex equivalence. So I could purposefully use a complex equivalence. The fact that you are sitting down with me today and we're going over this proposal means that you're going to take action, aren't you? The fact that you, I have the listing agreement out and we've gone through all of it and everything looks good means that you're signing a listing agreement right now, aren't you? Those are not actually equals. Seeing a listing agreement does not actually mean signing it. But purposefully, I'm embedding the word means that, linking this to this, so at a neurological level, the person wants to take action. I'm making this to equal this, which is not equal to, but the fact that you're looking at the listing agreement, I've gone over it with you, and everything looks good, means that we're taking action today, aren't we? See? Purposefully using it. So that's complex equivalence. Now, it's pretty obvious to all of us I'm a trainer, yes? Am I not a trainer? I'm a trainer. So, and, and if I were to ask you, we're going to take a moment and just take a look at something interesting here. If I were to ask you, who are you? What would you say? Who are you? And what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you say back to me who you are, not your name, but how you would define yourself, who are you? I'm going to have you say back to me who you are. Uh, and uh, rather than all of us sort of say it all at one time, out loud, let's just say it inside our head. So I want you to answer the question, who are you? As you're looking at me, it's just verbalizing your mind who you are to me for 30 seconds. Obviously, you're not going to say it out loud because we've got multiple people. Uh, I want you to say it in your mind, who are you? Okay? So ready? And I've got a reason why I'm doing this and has everything to do with what we're learning with the complex equivalents. And it's a breakthrough for some people, most people. So ready? Who are you? Take 30 seconds and in your mind, just share with me who you are. Go. One, two, three, go. Put your hand up if you share it with me who you are. Okay? Question for you. The thing that you just shared with me that you are, are you not more than that? Aren't you more than that? Aren't you more than what you just said? Whatever, whatever you just said right now, aren't you more than that? So let's do this one more time. We get to play full out now, yes? I'm going to ask you one more time, and I'll explain exactly what I'm doing in a moment. Who are you? Take another 20 seconds and just say back to me who you are. Ready? Go.
Jeff's in the back. He's like, deep question, deep question. Okay, so can I ask you another question? Aren't you more than that? Aren't you even more than what you said the second time? You are, right? Of course you are. So what's the point? If I say I'm a trainer, am I a trainer? Yeah, but aren't I more than that? Aren't I even more than that? I'm not just a trainer. Father, man, spiritual being living in the human body, coach of top producers, coach of set to 21 showcase. I'm so many more things, yes? And so if we went out on the street and we asked people, who are you? How many of us agreed that we would hear, I'm a teacher, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer? And what we call this in Eastern philosophy is a false identification, where people get this label that they think they are a teacher, and they say that's what they are. And notice my hand is here. That's what they are. They limit themselves by the labels they give themselves. There's a theory that Anything that you use the word after I am is on some level limiting you, unless you're saying I am infinite. <laughs> so anything after I am begins to label you unless it's infinite. And you're so much more than the I am of anything you could say, except for you're saying it, you're infinite. Make sense? So why are we learning this? We're learning that complex equivalents People are making them into labels that limit them when they are so much more than that. Make sense? I'll give you one last example before we go on to the next thing. <clears throat> I don't have a degree, and that means that I'll never amount to anything. How many of us have heard that before? You don't have a college education. You didn't go to Pepperdine like Veronica. <laughs> you didn't go to Harvard. You didn't go to Ivy League. Oh, you didn't go to Ivy League. It just means that, you know, there's no chance of you earning $100,000 the first year out of college. How many have heard that before? You didn't graduate with a high school diploma. <clears throat> and that means that you never amount to anything. There's a perception there about that, correct? And we know that's absolutely bogus. Who are some people that have barely graduated high school or haven't even graduated? Haven't even gone to college? And they're one of the, uh, some of the most successful people. You know them, right? Who are they? Who knows of someone who's very successful that didn't go graduate from college? You probably know quite a few people. Graduating college, albeit great, education is great, it's certainly not a guarantee for having a successful life. What is a guarantee for having a successful life is learning and mastering NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, and also taking action on it. Make sense? Okay. Awareness. <clears throat> Tip offs to awareness, number five, awareness. We've got the visual, auditory, kinesthetic, olfactory, and gustatory. So tip offs for awareness is visual, I see. Auditory, I hear. Kinesthetic, I feel. Olfactory, I smell, and gustatory, I taste. There are also some very wonderful ways of directing people's attention using presuppositions of awareness. Do you remember I said directing the pictures in their head, the voices, the sounds, directing that, the internal things in their mind? I could say, I wonder if you've noticed yet that one of your hands... One of your hands feels differently, differently than the other. Do you notice that? That one of your hands feels differently than the other? And that means that one of those hands feels an urge to rise and ask questions. It's the hand that feels different, the hand that embodies asking questions, right? So what I'm doing is I'm starting to direct, correct, the internal feelings. One of the hands feels different, and now I'm directing it to raise up, rise up, and ask the question. We 
want to pay close attention to what people say when they use the words, I see, I hear, I feel, in your business with your clients. I'll give you an example. This is fascinating. This is so fascinating. People say to us, I don't see what you mean. We've heard this before, yes? Uh, I don't see what you mean. And what we sometimes take that to be is they don't get it. But what we don't realize is there's something presupposed by that. Someone ever, ever said to you, I don't see what you mean on something? What's presupposed with that is literally they haven't yet made a picture inside their head so they can see what it is that you're talking about. So when we break it down more neurologically, we get some gold in there that we didn't get before. Oftentimes someone says, I don't see what you mean, and we go, I don't know why he doesn't get it, right? Why doesn't he get it? We don't go, hmm, this person has not made yet a picture inside their head of what I'm talking about. When they say, I don't see what you mean, I ought to right now talk about the picture that, that they should see. Start to build the picture in their mind so they see what I mean. Maybe they're more visual and my, maybe I'm more analytical. Maybe I'm giving them steps and procedures and sequences and I'm getting research and data and numbers, but they're a picture person. So they're seeing all these numbers, but they don't see what you mean because they don't have the what? A picture. So what does this do? Because I've learned this, when anybody ever says, I don't see what you mean, I'm gonna take a step back and I'm gonna go, huh, they don't have a picture in their mind yet of what I'm talking about. And I'm gonna step back in and I'm gonna to start to build a picture. Can you think of an example of this? What would be a good example of this in real estate when someone says to you, I don't see what you mean? Or in any business? Well, real estate might be if you say, you say I, don't, I don't see what you, I don't see your point, I don't see what you mean. I don't see your point, I don't see what you mean. About this is a great buy. That this is a great buy. Yes. So I'm going to adjust this just briefly. It's more, more horizontal. Yes. Uh, I don't see what you mean that this is a great buy. So what you would need to do is build a picture of it being a great buy. They don't have a picture in their mind of it being a great buy. So how would you verbally begin to build that picture in their mind that it is a great buy? What you might want to do is show them how other things are not a great buy, the law of contrast. Right? Good example. Now let me ask you another question. Who here knows someone who is, they go off of feeling, gut instinct and feeling in making decisions? A lot of us, yes? So what if someone says to you, I don't know, I get it, just, I just don't feel it. I just don't, I, 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 it doesn't feel right. You know, let me, let me think about it for a couple of days, a week, or whatever, and I get back to you. Some of us put labels on that going, oh, I don't have a rapport, the person doesn't feel me, they don't trust me. We start to put all, all of our labels on that, correct? When someone says, I don't feel right about this, we start to feel that the, the, the emotions coming up, like, oh my gosh, this person doesn't feel comfortable for me, with me, and then we go into whatever state we go into. We ought to realize when the person says this doesn't feel right, it means that they haven't yet put together the feelings sufficiently about it, and as a result, it doesn't feel right. So what do you do? You start to use language and talk about what it is to feel good about this. You stop all the, the, the information, the data, the research, you stop all that and you focus on what is it that they see perhaps, or what is it that they need to feel to feel right, and you get them to that feeling. Give me an example. Let's say you're doing a, you're walking someone through a house, right? And maybe they feel off about something about the house. 
one room too small, ceilings too low, kitchen, countertop, some, some things off. And, and in the back of their head, that's that one thing that's stopping them. And then at the end, they're saying to you, I don't know, I like it, it's just, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. What might you do? You might walk them over to everything else about the house that feels great, all right? And focus on what does feel right, and then focus on one thing that it's something that can be changed. You can even say, what would happen if? <laughs> what would happen if we were able to make this small adjustment in the kitchen? What would you feel now having made this change? I mean, in a way, you could see this kitchen right now with that modification, couldn't you? Now, how would that feel right now? It would feel good, wouldn't it? So what we're doing when someone says it doesn't feel right, you're, you're tapping into the feeling is off for them. How do I build the right feeling? And then even if it means focusing on all the strengths of this opportunity and focusing on what can be corrected and what will they feel when, it, when that corrected, uh, correction has been made. Make sense? Make sense? Good, awesome. Okay, number, uh, number six, time. Time is huge, guys. Time is really huge. Time is a wonderful presupposition. I use it all the time, <laughs> all the time. I don't know if you've noticed, if you've ever heard me speak, I'm always talking about the past, the present, and the what? And the future. The verb tense is extremely important in communication. Now let me ask you this question. <clears throat> if you were to talk about a client's problem, if a client had a problem, would you, and as you're hearing the sound of this, maybe you think of times when a client did have a problem. If you had a client that had a problem, would you communicate to the client about their problem heavily, like it's something that's in their future? No, because it's always in front of them, always being a problem for them, make sense? Would you talk about their problem heavily as it's something happening to them right here, right now? In reality, if they tell you they have a problem, it is happening in the now, correct? But that's not what we're asking. We're not asking so much what you would want to do to observe that it's a problem for them now. We're talking about influence. Who wants to be influential here? What you want to do is you want to take your client's problem, it's happening right now, and you want to start to put it in the past. So let's say I'm the client. I'm going to put myself back here. And I've got this problem right in front of me. I'm blocked by this problem. Now it's not a good time to sell. Or <clears throat> whatever it is. I think I'm going to regret this decision or whatever resistance I have at this problem. If I'm the client and you move this problem into my past, where now it's in my past and it's kind of like behind me, now what do I have in front of me? Complete freedom and opportunity. So here it's a little tricky, but you can start to use language like this. That was a problem, wasn't it? That was a problem, wasn't it? I mean, when, once we solved that problem, that was a problem, wasn't it? What we're doing is we're taking a client's resistance to problem. I know you were concerned, weren't you? I know you had fear, didn't you? <laughs> You're putting their problem in the past and creating a space where now they have no problem now and in front of them. Make sense? So write that down. You want to start linguistically if you want to influence your clients to move beyond their problems, you want to start linguistically making their problems appear in their mind as a past. You might say, it was a problem, wasn't it? Whenever you talk about a client's problem to a client, you should always be using the past tense. Now, you need to be careful with some of this stuff. You don't want to be so blatantly obvious and disrespectful 
when someone's sharing this big problem and you just, you make it out like, you know, something's not there that's actually there. So you want to use your, your, uh, you want, you want to be more covert, more graceful with that, you know? Um, so that was a problem, wasn't it? I mean, when we saw this problem, it was a problem, wasn't it? I mean, it wouldn't be a problem anymore, correct? Once we get this covered, it will be a past problem in the past, correct? So how I'm linguistically doing that is I'm shifting it from the present to the past. Okay. What, other, what are other tip-offs for time? The word stop, the word now, the word yet. These are all other tip-offs for the word time. And you hear this all the time where people use verb tenses, correct, in their language. I'll give you an example. Let's say I say to you, I haven't signed a listing agreement yet. What is that presupposing? Yet means they're going to, right? Uh, when is now the time to take action? What is that presuppose they're going to do? Now. Now is an embedded command. Correct? You're directing. Uh, I suggest you stop having the problem. Right? Stop having the problem. The problem is in the past now, isn't it? Correct. Now, quickly on goals, when you talk about problems, you're going to put the problem in the past. Make sense? What, what, how would you talk about goals, though? Would you talk about goals as in the future, I'm going to achieve this goal? Would you use the future tense? Would you use now? Or would you use past? Correct. You would use now. What you're doing when you use now is you're essentially acting as if you've achieved the goal now. Some people would say you even might want to put it, put it in the past. Right? Now or in the past. Past is a little bit more... Um, it's, it ties into a little bit of our timeline therapy processes that we do. But definitely you want to at least not have goals in the future. You want to have goals that they see they can realize and achieve right now. Make sense? Okay. Adjective adverb. This is funny. Number seven. And we're going to be going through some scripts and some questions in a moment. Adjective adverb. Now this is interesting. What you're going to do, and I'm going to give you two examples. You're going to pay attention close to the word that seems out of place with adjective adverbs. I was watching TV and on the news, they had got this guy. Uh, I won't go into the, the crime because it wasn't, it was not a good crime. Not a good crime that I would want to talk about because it's a negative picture. But someone had committed a crime and uh, he was being interviewed and they just couldn't find evidence. But yet he was the only person that was there, and story, 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 they just couldn't find any hard evidence of you know, how the crime was committed, they didn't find anything. So uh, he kind of got off. Um, and he was uh, being interviewed on uh, one of those uh, shows, uh, one of those late night shows with an interviewer, and uh, he said, I'm totally innocent. He's looking in the camera. He's doing some funny stuff with his eyes, too. Which, by the way, when you learn more about NLP, and some of you have already taken our uh, second, third weekend of our practitioner program, you know about eye movements. You know when someone's lying or telling the truth. You'll learn that. If you haven't learned that, you'll learn that. If you've learned that, you already know you learned that. And that's called eye access and cues in NLP. But let's forget the eye movements. It was what he said was very interesting. He said, I'm totally innocent. Maybe he didn't say it like that. He didn't say I'm totally innocent. He said, he said, I'm totally innocent. <laughs> he said, I'm totally innocent. Isn't that interesting? That's what he did. And I went, well, that's interesting. Totally. Totally innocent. Um, is there any such thing as half innocent, three quarters innocent, one quarter innocent? What, what is totally innocent? I mean, would it be like someone said to you, um, I'm totally pregnant. Would that make any sense? I mean, you're either pregnant or you're not. You can't be quarter pregnant, 
half pregnant, three quarters pregnant, full pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not. But yet he used the word, he didn't say I'm innocent. He said I'm totally innocent. That word in there seemed to me a little bit out of place. I'll give you another example. And many of us know this person. Almost got impeached. Or got impeached, but got off. Uh, former President Bill Clinton. And you're going to laugh at this. Many of us will laugh at this. He said, I didn't have sex with that woman. Oh, no, no. He didn't use the hand gesture. He says, I didn't have sex with that woman. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Why use the word that? Why use the word that? What, 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 he, what was presupposed? What was he, what was, what was, remember, we're learning what's behind the meaning. What's behind? Because we all know what happened, right? The whole world found out. What's behind the word that woman? Was he saying, yeah, I had sex with a lot of women, but not that woman? <laughs> was, he, was he saying I didn't have sex with that woman? But a bunch of other stuff? Do you see? The word that is a tip-off. It's out of place. It's abnormal. And what I'm sharing with you, when people communicate to us all the time, they're saying little words, they're doing little things that tell us more what's not behind the surface than what we think. Make sense? So I could use an adjective adverb on purpose. I could say, notice how easy it is to become a top producer when you follow these five steps. What am I focusing on? I'm focusing on the word what? Easy. easy, right? I could say it's very easy to learn this language, NLP language. We're going to be learning how to uh, more about presuppositions. We're also going to learn about Milton model language, which is building instant agreement, instant rapport with anybody, anywhere, anytime. I could say NLP is easy to learn, easy to do, and easy to remember. Yes? I might, I might also say you haven't realized how easy it is to go into a trance just yet. While you're thinking, by the way, trance, we described it as being in a relaxed state. Has anybody ever gone to church, gone to church? And everybody's just there, and they're just like, just in a trance, in a form of hypnosis. By the way, we're in hypnosis all the time. You ever go to a movie? We're in hypnosis while we're watching a movie. We're constantly in hypnosis. Anytime we're, we're letting go of all our, you know, our judgments, our filters, and we're just experiencing something going along with the story, we're in a form of hypnosis, whether small, medium, or large. So <clears throat> when I say you probably haven't realized how easy it is to go into a trance just yet, while your mind is going easy, am I going into trance easily? All the while you're thinking about how easy it is if you are going into trance, you're going into what? Exactly. As you ponder the word easy, you're going into what? Trance. Exactly. Either way, you're going into trance. Okay, let's go to number eight. Exclusive, inclusive. The takeoff for inclusive, exclusive is the word or. Now, how many of us have ever heard of Tommy Hawkins? Tom Hawkins. Alternative choice questions. Would you like to meet on Tuesday or Thursday? At 2 o'clock or 4 o'clock? Would you like to buy the refrigerator with the stainless steel that uh, shows fingerprints when you touch it? Or would you like to buy the refrigerator with stainless steel that doesn't show the fingerprints when you touch it? Notice I've given you an illusion of choice, right? So anytime you give a person an illusion of choice, this or that, their, their mind feels like they have to pick one. It's not yes or no, it's which one. That's why we use illusion of choice. That's why we use alternative choice questions. Have you guys been using ors in your communication? Would you like to buy the house today or would you like to buy the house tonight? Well, you can say to your kids, would you like to uh, have stuff, kids? They don't want to clean up the room. They don't want to brush their teeth or whatever their stuff is. Would you like to brush your teeth before breakfast or after breakfast? Would you like to clean your room before we go? to the park, or would you like to clean your room right after, before we get ready for dinner? Notice that they have to pick one or the other. Not, yes I am, or no I'm not, it's at what time. Make sense? Awesome, 
Last one is ordinal. And ordinal is a list including words like first, last, next. The first thing I want to cover is this. The second thing I want to cover is this. So anytime you hear the word first, last, or next, the construction, presupposition, and construction is it is an ordinal, which means that it has an order to it. Okay? Now let's go to page, the next page, which is page what? 37? <clears throat> Grab page 37 in your binder, which is presupposition. Presuppositions, and it'll look like this. Okay? And we're going to go through some of these questions as I grab a little more tea. All right. So, we are back. First statement. I'm not sure, by the way, uh, these are things that clients have actually said. So, I know this is, may sound crazy, but these are actually some things clients have said. So, we put them here so that we can learn about this. You have the page in front of you. I'm glad. All right. So, our goal when we go through this list is to decide what's a presupposition and what's a mind read. Please write this down. <clears throat> a presupposition is means that the word is actually present in the sentence. We're talking about a presupposition. The word is actually present in the sentence. It's a fact. It's in there. It's presupposed in their sentence because whatever we're presupposing is actually a word in their sentence. Whereas, a mind read is something that's not present in the sentence. We're reminded that it's there. Let's go with example one. Number one. I'm not sure. Do you need to reach Johnny? Johnny. Okay, cool. Just that that we worked off of. All right, so, yes, we're still here. Page 37, yes, or is it 36 in your book? 37. Page 37, presuppositions, again, it looks like this, like that. Okay. I'm not sure whether or not I should stop being my wife. A, the question is, is it a presupposition or is it a mind read? We're going to go through each one individually. A, he has a wife. Is that a presupposition or is that a mind read? Presupposition. presupposition, because the word wife is in a sentence, right? B, he loves his wife. Is that a presupposition or a mind read? It's a mind read. Why? Because we don't know if he loves his wife because love does not appear in that sentence. So you're right when you said I'm not sure because he never uses the word love. So you're not sure whether he loves. For us to say he loves his wife, well, maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. So you're right. It would be mind reading, guessing that he loves her if he does because he doesn't actually say it, right? Um, so that's why it's a uh, mind read, not a presupposition. It's not presupposed he loves her by what he said. I'm not sure whether or not I should stop beating my wife because he never uses the word love. C, he currently beats his wife. Presupposition or mind read? Which one would you say? Presupposition. Presupposition, right. Because he said stop being. <laughs> so that presupposes, right? Number D, He's a little life swap who should be shot. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely a mind read. Uh, you know, it's definitely not. It, it's true. He probably should be shot. But it's a mind read because it's not in the sentence. Okay. Number two. I don't see why I can't do it. All of my friends are doing it. Hey. He feels that he is treated unfairly. Mind read, right? Because nowhere does it talk about being treated unfairly. 
So it's a mind read. B, he wants to be liked by his friends. Mind read. Now where does it say anything about being liked by friends? C, this person's friends do something he doesn't do. Presupposition. This person's friends do something he doesn't do. It's presupposition. And D, all of his friends are bums and should be shocked. Mind read, right? All of his friends, yeah, exactly. It's not even in the sentence. Now let's go to number three. If I don't learn how to communicate with my boss, I won't get a raise. A, he feels that he is treated unfairly. Mind read. Now, where does it say that in the sentence? We're finding out what's presupposed and what's a mind read that's not really there. B, he doesn't know how to communicate with his boss. Right. If I don't learn how to communicate with my boss, I won't get a raise. That presupposes he does not know how to communicate with his boss. C, he wants to learn new behaviors. Mind read, right? This could be on the edge. You know, it could also be perhaps a presupposition. I mean, think about it. He says, if I don't learn how to communicate with my boss, I won't get a raise. You could infer that he wants to learn communication by that sentence. So you wouldn't be wrong. You could say presupposition that he wants to learn new behaviors, a new way of communicating. It could also be a mind read. It can kind of go both ways. Number D, his salary is connected to his communication skills. What would you say? Presupposition. Absolutely. There's a connection between the two. Number four, I have to set up Unrealistic expectations. A, he can't stop making unrealistic expectations. He says, I, he says, I have to set up unrealistic expectations. A, he can't stop making unrealistic ex expectations. It could be mind read. Do you see how it also could be presupposition? Because he's saying, I have to. Which almost is way it's also saying I can't stop. So mind read as well. Absolutely mind read as well. B, he feels trapped. Mind read, because nowhere in that thing does it say trapped. C, he has expectations. Sure. Absolutely, because the word expectations appears in the sentence. And D, he knows when he's being unrealistic. Obviously, presupposition, right? So number five. I'm feeling much better now. I can see how some of the things I was doing just made me unhappy. A, some behavior he engaged in was related to some internal state. Presupposition. B, he has feelings. Presupposition. C. He has more control of his life now. Mind read. And D. He fixed himself so he would shouldn't be shot. Mind read. Right. All right. Now page thirty-seven. 38, page 38, yes, page 38, which looks like this, okay, now, would you agree that we've got a sense of what's a presupposition or what's a mind read? We do, right? We're now going to take it the next level up. What we want to do is we want to find out what, which of the structures is it? Remember when we looked at page 36? We had nine different 
presupposition structures. So get out page 36 and put it alongside page 38. And you're going to have both of these side by side. So, <clears throat> what we're going to do is <clears throat> we're going to find out what's a presupposition, what's a mind read, and then when we decipher that it's a presupposition, we want to then call out which of the presuppositions it is. Makes sense on page 36. Is it a presupposition of existence? A possibility of necessity, cause and effect, complex equivalence, awareness, time, adjective adverb, exclusive inclusive, or formal. Okay, that's what we're going to do next. All right. Okay, here we go. Yes? Now, there may be, when we hear these statements, there may be more than one presupposition. But what we want you to do is focus on the major one in each sentence. Okay, let's start. Number one, and you'll follow along with me. This is really funny. Number one, if the cat meows again, I'll have to put him outside. If the cat meows again, I'll have to put him outside. So we're talking about presuppositions, only presuppositions. And the question is, which one of these it is? So we're only talking about presuppositions and these are the different categories. If a cat meows again, I'll have to put him outside. Which one is it on the list of presuppositions? Existence and cause and effect. Existence and cause and effect. So what would be the major one? So what we're going to do is we'll call out all of them. That's great. We're going to focus on what's the major one. Cause and effect. Absolutely. You said cause and effect. That's true. We have a if then but without the then. If the cat meows again, I'll have to put him outside. It's an if then. The person just left out the word then, but it's if then. If the cat meows again, then I'll have to put him outside. That's an if then structure, which is a tip off for cause and effect. Good job. Question for you. Is the cat male or female? Because it says, if the cat meows again, I'll have to put him outside. Is the cat male or female? Male. Hmm. We're hearing that it's male. If the cat meows again, I'll have to put him outside. We're hearing that he's male, right? Um, how do you know? How do you know it's him? How do you know it's uh, male? Uh, who is him? What if it's the husband that's teasing the cat? If the cat meows again, I have to put him, the husband, who's teasing the cat, I have to put him outside. <laughs> A lot of mind reading. A lot of mind reading. Yes. What if it's not even the husband? What if it's the dog? If the cat meows again, let's say the dog is outside, looking through the sliding glass door, and the cat's there, to the dog. But what if the person's saying, if the cat meows again because I'm on a conference call, I have to put him outside with the dog? Or what if the dog is inside with the cat, the dog is disturbing the cat, and if the cat meows again, I'm going to have to take the dog and put it, the dog in the backyard? So it's interesting. We're just having fun with this. When you're going deep, we're wondering. What's a mind read and how are we picking up the subtleties going on the language? Johnny, what we're doing is we are on page 37, 38, actually, and we're going through presuppositions and specifically uh, which ones they are. I'm going to take a moment just to get John caught up. Johnny got called out, he's back in. Uh, you were here when we covered this list. And what we're doing is we're now going on page 38 through certain statements, and we're finding out which of these presuppositions exist in this script of questions, uh, in this script of statements. Okay. 
And what we're going to do is we're calling out the most major ones that show up in these. And, and the first one we did, quick recap, is if the cat if the cat meows again, I'll have to put him outside. That's an if and a then structure, which is a cause and effect, and that's what we covered. So now we're going to go to number two. And number two, it was her friendly smile that made me walk up and say hi. It was her friendly smile that made me walk up and say hi. Now, which one of these is on there? Say awareness. Huh? Awareness. Awareness. The tip off word is made me. It was her friendly smile that made me walk up and say hi. To make falls under what category? Cause and effect. Absolutely. Good, good, good. Number three, if only he had come home on time, the party wouldn't have gone out of control. If only he had come home on time, the party wouldn't have gone out of, uh, gone out of control. Cause and effect. Again, it's an if, then, but with the then is implied. The then is not there. If only he had come on time, the party would have gone out of control. So it's if, then. Cause and effect. Number four, people have always <laughs> given me more to do than I can handle. What is that? Always. Always. And which one is that tip off for? I want you to write that down on number six. Correct. Stop now yet. Write down the word always next to that. That's a presupposition of time because we have the word always there. Number five, his easygoing personality is good PR for our company. Which one is that? There's two words standing out. His easygoing personality is good PR for our company. The word is. Remember we talked about that? Yes, complex equivalence. You guys are getting it all. Good job. Is or means, right? His easygoing personality is, this is easygoing personality, is equal to good PR for our company. That's a complex equivalence. Also, you have the word easy. His easygoing personality, easy also is a adjective adverb. But secondary to the one that you caught for a complex equivalence. <clears throat> All right, number six, time. Okay, number six, sorry. Stop watching over your shoulder. Give you a hint. Stop watching over your shoulder. Time. Stop watching over your shoulder. Time, yes. And also, word... How about the word watching? It's awareness, yes? Because of the word watching, which is visual, which ties into awareness. Okay, good job. Number seven, only you can learn this. Only you can learn this. What, which one is that? Is that a uh, possibility, necessity? Uh, can, correct. Can would definitely be 
Possibility and necessity, absolutely. Possibility, uh, impossibility, yes. Uh, and more importantly, the word only. Only you can learn this. What does that tie into? Exclusive. exclusive. Yes. Exclusive. It's under number eight, exclusive, inclusive, or, but this one in particular is, is, is exclusive. Only you can learn this. means only you and excludes everyone else. Make sense? Number eight. Either she goes to the store or I do. Either she goes to the store or I do. Either she goes to the store or, or, ah, uh, yes, yes. Exclusive, inclusive. This time it's the inclusive. Correct. Number nine. First the winds came, then the rain. First the winds came, then the rain. First the winds came, then the rain. Huh? Yes, it's not a cause and effect, right? First the winds came, then the rain. It's definitely not a cause and effect. No one said the wind brings the rain. It just said, first the winds came, then the rain. But it's definitely not a cause and effect. Because the winds can come and no rain. Or you know, yes. Or no, our time, of course, right? So or no, so there's an order and sequence. First the winds came, then the rain. Awesome. And number 10, ordinal. Okay, sorry, I'm reading the script. Number 10, sorry. Uh, opera makes me want to cry. Cause and effect. Makes me, right? Cause and effect. Opera makes me want to cry. That's true, by the way, depending on what opera you go to. Uh, cry in a good way, of course. Awesome. Okay, well, guess what we just did? <clears throat> we just learned how we learned why learning presuppositions is important how we can get the meaning behind the meaning of what someone says. We learned what a presupposition and what a mind read is. We learned how mind reading can lead us to potentially to trouble. <clears throat> However, we'll learn later how to use mind reading in a way when you're using language, not listening, but feeding language that you can use in a way to empower people who are not there just yet. And we learned presuppositions. We learned the different uh, presuppositions and we learned how people structure their sentences. So I submit to you that your investment of time in language will re be repaid to you tenfold. This is not something that we expect for you to become a master at in one hour, uh, but the more you put time and energy into learning how to listen and learning uh, uh, language, specifically as it relates to NLP language, the more benefits you'll get and then also, we just want you to know we're introducing it to you today so you can start to become aware of what people say. And we're also letting you know that uh, you want to pay close attention to, you want your hearing to be more in tune to what people are saying, what's the meaning behind what they're saying, what's their map of the world going on, what are they saying without what, are they, what they're really saying, what are they hiding, and then also, uh, are there anything that's misplaced that they're saying that's a tip-off or something else that they're at an unconscious level saying to you the way Bill Clinton said it, or the way the person said it on the news about being innocent. So, awesome. So far, we've covered presuppositions. What questions do you have? What do you learn? What did you learn? And what do we need to know? Questions, Johnny. I'm curious to find out that if it would be appropriate to do or to use mirror matching as well. Would that add any kind of emphasis to the power of how you communicate with somebody? When would that be appropriate? Mirror matching and tonality, of course. Mimic your prospect. Type yes, thing. yes. Uh, in the topic we're discussing today, I, I personally believe everything starts with rapport. Everything starts with rapport. Anytime you're saying with a client, 
your employees, your staff, your children, starts with a place of rapport. Uh, we can uh, uh, get rapport through, through uh, mirror matching, uh, voice tonality, facial gestures, body language, breathing. Perhaps one of the most powerful ways to get in rapport with someone is to find out what's the pace of their breath. And is it coming from high up in their chest, middle chest, low, and to kind of start to breathe at the pace. So we know the power of mirror matching, and we know how to specifically mirror match if we've learned rapport, which is um, finding something that you can do similar to your client that's very subtle. Um, you want to be in rapport right away, and you want to be in rapport almost pretty much the whole time. So the question is, how would you then bring in mirror matching with this topic, which is uh, learning language and the presupposition, what's assumed by your client's language? How would you tie in mirror matching with that? I would say you're doing it simultaneously. You're always building rapport. You're always mirror matching, unless you're not. At some point, once you've mirror matched, and this is the thing that I notice is missing, unfortunately, in many trainings. Um, we work with another huge brand, considered the biggest brand of real estate in the world, and uh, they're taught constantly, rapport and mirror matching. And then I ask them, okay, so you've gone through that program, you've learned mirror matching, so what do you do next? And they look at me dumbfounded. They go, well, just continue mirror matching, continue mirror matching. That's all they've been taught. And um, uh, there's a problem with that. We mirror and match for a purpose. We're off topic, by the way, but it's good because it's all, it's all one thing. Just letting you know we're off presuppositions. We're talking about mirror and matching, but it's important to learn how these things go together. Um, there's a purpose to mirror and matching, and that purpose is leading, leadership. Getting the person to follow your lead, whether it's sign a listing agreement, decide to hire you on as an agent, take action, whatever it is. We want them to take action. We want to serve the client. We want to get the job done. We want to do an amazing job. And then we personally want to also make a good living and have a great life. So if we want to lead and be the leader, be the expert, and get the client to take action, we need to do this thing called build rapport. How do we build rapport? I won't go into the, the full complexity of it now. You've taken our training. You already know about our rapport. But if you're seeing this for the first time, come to our training to learn about building rapport. We've all heard you build rapport by mirror matching. But you don't stay there. You don't mirror match for the rest of your life, the same person, the same. You don't. You mirror match to build rapport where they feel like you are just like them. They feel at an unconscious level, hey, he's just like me. He gets me. You know, we, we talk the same talk, we walk the same walk. There's something like, I'm feeling this guy. When I look at him, I feel like I'm seeing myself. It ties into the law of vanity. People, most people, like, you know, like to have, uh, you know, they like to hear themselves talk. They like their own ideas more than others. So it's a prize of law of vanity. So you're building a rapport to have that connection. But at some point, you've got to stop mirror matching and you've got to do this thing called pacing and leading. And that's my issue when I go into all these companies and everybody's been taught mirror matching. They think rapport is mirror matching. They do not learn that you've got to stop mirror matching and you've got to start pacing and leading. What is pacing and leading? Pacing and leading is you're no longer copying their voice tonality. You're no longer copying their facial gestures or body language. You go back to being you. You go back to your own tonality, your own direction, your own uh, uh, self, and their purpose is for them at an unconscious level to start emulating you. So I'll give you this, and we're off topic, but this is good. If all you did is you sat with a client for the next year, and every single you met, sat down with a member, you copied or emulated their voice tonight, their body language, guess what? They would be leading you. They would be leading you. You would not be influencing them. You'd basically be their protege, their apprentice, their model. You want to mirror match to build a rapport with them. When you feel you've got that great rapport, then you start to go back to your own speed 
and see if because you're in such great rapport with them, if they start picking up the speed. Then you start taking the action. You start going through the listening group. You start doing stuff. If they're starting to go at your speed, now they're mirror matching you, but they don't even know it. So I would suggest that when we're doing presuppositions, tying to your question, bring this whole thing together. Um, you're always building rapport. You're, you're mirror matching. However, once you got to that place where you know you have great rapport, you're going to start pacing and leading. Pacing and leading. Uh, one of the best pacing and lead, pace, pacers and leaders is uh, 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 President Obama. You know, what he did is he, he talked about, you know, in the first two uh, um, elections, that, uh, the uh, elections that he won, he would talk about where America is, where people are at. He would, you know, focus on what their experiences in life are, and he would get everybody in rapport with them because he was speaking about their situations, their problems. He would get everybody brought into, by, by literally just telling them what their experience is. And then he would say, you know, yes, we can. So eventually, once he got that rapport with everybody, he then started to say, this is the direction I want to go. And they all started to follow his lead. At that point, he already had the rapport. At that point, he was leading. And then people were taking action to vote for him. So you're going to be doing this all simultaneously. However, what I would suggest is to separate these two for now. Learn and master rapport distinctly. And learn and master presuppositions and language separately because they're, very, they're two completely different skill sets using totally different types, parts of your body and your mind. And then when you master this and you master this, then bring them both together and see if you can do it all together. Right? I think it's a little bit too much to try to really pay close attention to what someone's saying, what's behind it, while at the same time trying to mirror match their body postures. <laughs> it's just too much going on at the same time. But I would say that just like is in anything, we all drove a stick shift car for the first time. It was next to impossible to, to know how to do the clutch, the accelerator, the, the gear shift, the rear, like all of those things. Eventually, once we mastered each one of those things, we were able to do them all effectively to, uh, together simultaneously, such that we do it easy. Now we do it easy. We can even shave on the <laughs> drive stick, <laughs> shave or fix our tire, do all kinds of other things simultaneously, place phone calls, receive phone calls, and so forth. So. Great question. Uh, I wanted to kind of, did, did that make sense? Uh, did, did, I'm just curious, I'm going to ask you a question uh, because this comes up a lot. Um, in your travels and in your learning from different coaches, speakers, have they really taught that you stop mirror matching at some point, pace and lead, and then your goal is to get them to mirror match you? I've always had little snippets from different areas and Yes, I think what I was trying to scrape out was to try to find out what is the recipe of all these, what would be the perfect recipe for everything that in, in that, my world. Yes. What would be the perfect recipe for me to succeed? Knowing all the little snippets that I have right now. Yeah. And every time that we meet and I hear you, obviously I'm getting more and more. Are you available December 3rd, 4th? No, at this point in time. December 3rd, 4th or January 28th, 29th? Maybe. Yeah, it's Saturday, Sunday. Um, I would say, because I, I think you've done the trimetric stuff with us. Yes. But I don't think you've done the NLP stuff. Has he? No. I don't think. I, because you, you came in like towards the end of last year. So you're going to learn a lot of this other stuff in that two day course. And, and I would suggest Saturday, Sunday, in two days it would be a good investment of your time, energy, resources. Okay, so I'm going to ask you guys, what questions do you have? What did you learn? What do we need to know about presuppositions? I want you to write them down, and I want you to bring them with you when we see each other next time. We're probably, it's either going to be right before weekend four or after weekend four uh, of PRAC before uh, uh, master PRAC. So you'll have an opportunity to ask your questions. But that's really the power of presuppositions. The next thing we are going to cover is going to be 
hierarchy of ideas, which, by the way, that's a phenomenal uh, module that ties into how you are able to control a conversation. How many of you like to learn how to control a conversation? How many of you feel like sometimes you talk to people, they're, they give you so much detail, they detail you to death. It's just so much information, it's like blah, 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 and it's just like it's hard to get it all, it's just too much to consume because they just talk in so much detail that it just comes across jargon. Anybody ever heard a speaker, a speaker like that where you got lost in all the information or overwhelmed by it? Well, the reverse is true. How many have had an experience where uh, you heard a speech and the person was so out there in space with what they were saying in the ozone layer that you just had no clue what they were talking about? You left like, I don't know one thing. I heard a lot of things, but I don't know really one thing to make of this presentation that this person did. They were at a, pre a pre presenter speak too abstract, too vague, where it almost was a little frustrating. So what we're learning is that there's ambiguity, abstract, and there's specificity. And we're learning how you, all of us as leaders, will be able to communicate in a way where you can go up into abstract, stay middle chunk, so this is high chunk, large, big picture, middle chunk, and detailed picture, you'll learn how to navigate up and down so that you can meet everybody in the audience that you need to meet and everybody can get what they need to get. And you'll also learn how to control that conversation. If someone is out there like this, speaking in very ambiguous terms, and you're not able to get what you need from the conversation, the specifics, the details, you'll learn one or two simple questions where you can, in a very subtle way, where you can bring them down to earth and get the details that you need to get. And someone who's so stuck in the details with just one or two simple questions, very covertly, very smooth, where you're able to navigate them up. So basically, you're able to control the conversation level of the conversation you have with anybody, anywhere, anytime. How many of us would like to learn how to do that? Okay, awesome. So that's gonna be a pretty uh, quick module, a little, a little shorter than the one we just did, maybe 20 minutes or so. So maybe even less than that. So what we're gonna do is take a quick five minute break. Yeah, take a quick five minute break. Stand up, move around, shake, shake our, shake our, uh, exactly, shake our, what our mama gave us. We're gonna get loose and we're gonna come back with 100% focus and we're gonna learn hierarchy of ideas, which essentially is how to control a conversation level with anybody, anywhere, anytime. What would that do for your business? What would that do for your income? And what would that do for your life? See you in five minutes. Can you pause? Or you can just keep rolling. But here's the thing: we keep it rolling. It's gonna be five yeah. minutes of that. It might be. Uh, we can stop. It might. It might be better if we separate them in little chunks for people.